Hey friends, hello and welcome. Let's talk about stanza number 8, 9 and 10 of Elegy written in the country churchyard in this video. We have seen stanzas 1 to 7 in earlier videos. Let's try to continue with that. Let's begin with stanza number 8. Let not ambition mock their useful toil, their homely joys in destiny obscure, nor grandeur here with a disdainful smile, the short and simple annals of the poor. Now let's look at the meaning of the difficult words. Mock is to scorn or laugh disdainfully. Toil is hard work. Obscure is not known. Disdainful is full of hatred and annals are the historical records. Now let us try to understand. Let not ambition mock their useful toil. There means the dead forefathers of the villages sleeping in the graves. Let not ambition mock their useful toil, hard work. They have done hard work and that was really useful. Nobody should consider that it was not useful work. Okay, so the, in the first line he says, let not ambition mock their useful toil. In the second he says, their homely joy is in their destiny obscure. Their hard work, their homely joy is because their joy is were limited to their own families. They were not of national importance or universal importance, but they were definitely important because they were the joys of their own families. So ambition should not mock their useful toil, their homely joys and their destiny because nobody knows what their destiny was. Therefore, it should not be mocked. It should not be laughed at disdainfully. In the second part, he says, nor grandeur here with a disdainful smile. Grandeur? A greatness, greatness of the things. Uh, it's kind of largeness. So, nor grandeur here with disdainful smile. Grandeur should not hear with disdainful smile. Disdainful, full of hatred, considering someone else as unimportant. That is. So, nor grandeur here with a disdainful smile. What? The short and simple annals of the poor. Very short. Their stories are very short. Annals are the historical records. So, their stories, their records are very short and they are very simple as they are not of the national importance. They are very short and they are uh, simple. So, these simple annals should not be heard with a disdainful smile. In short, in the eighth stanza, there are two imperative sentences joined by the semicolon. Look at the first one. Let not ambition mock their useful toil, their homely joys and their obscure destiny. As the forefathers referred to by the poet, in the earlier part, lewd and died in the village performing their routine duties, they are regarded as unambitious. Therefore, poet says that ambition should not mock their useful toil, although their work may not be noticed by the world or it may not have left its mark. It doesn't mean that it was not useful. Poet calls their joys as homely because these forefathers of the village did not indulge in war and other important activities of national importance. He regards their destiny as obscure because nobody knows about it. There is no written record or spoken record of their lives and of their fate. Poet combines three things together and puts them as the object to the first sentence which means the useful toil, homely joys and obscure destiny of the dead forefathers of the village should not be mocked. As there is nothing grand about the graves of the villagers, poet refers to grandeur as the subject in the second part of the sentence that forms its stanza of the poem. The short and simple stories of the poor people should not be heard with disdainful smile by grandeur. Grandeur should not consider their simplicity of these poor villagers as inferior and laugh at them scornfully. If you really want to understand or if it is really difficult for you to understand, try to understand this with the help of the questions. The question is, what should not be mocked? The useful toil, homely joys and obscure destiny of the poor forefathers of the village who are buried in the country churchyard should not be mocked, right? Who should not mock it? The ambition should not mock it. What should not be heard with disdainful smile? Short and simple annals, historical records. Short and simple historical records of the poor should not be heard with disdainful smile. What should not grandeur do? Grandeur should not hear with short and simple annals of the poor with disdainful smile. 
I hope you understood. Let's move on to the next stanza. Stanza number nine. The boast of heraldry, the pomp of power, and all that beauty, all that wealth ever gave awaits alike the inimitable hour. The paths of glory lead but to the grave. See the meaning of the difficult words. Boast is talk with too much pride. Heraldry is family history. Pomp is show, excessive show in fact. And inevitable is unavoidable. That cannot be avoided. The boast of heraldry, the pomp of power, and all the beauty, all that beauty, all that, all that wealth ever gave. Boast of heraldry, pomp of power, what has, whatever that has been given by the wealth, the beauty, everything awaits alike in, a, in the same fashion. Everything waits in the same fashion. Waits for what? Inevitable hour inevitable hour it waits for the inevitable hour that is going to happen whatever you have it's definitely going to happen to you because in the last line poet says the paths of glory lead but to the grave whatever there is even if you are very rich if you are poor all are definitely going to go to the grave at the end and that is what poet calls inevitable hour see uh, ninth stanza is poet's philosophy of life and death, which serves as the reason for poet's appeal in the eighth stanza. He says that boast of heraldry, pomp of power, all the beauty and everything that we get by wealth waits in the same fashion for the time which cannot be avoided. The final line of the ninth stanza is conclusion of what has been said in earlier three lines. Paths of glory lead but to the grave. Poet means to say that Roads that lead us to glory do not take us to any other place than the grave. It doesn't matter if a person is rich or poor because all are bound to die and will be buried as the poor village forefathers are buried. So, let's try to understand that this with the help of a few questions. What are weights alike for the inevitable hour according to the poet? Boast of heraldry, that's family history, the pomp, grand show of power, and all the beauty given by the wealth waits alike for the inevitable hour. Where do paths of glory lead according to the poet? Paths of glory lead nowhere else but to the grave according to the poet. What do you think poet has used the phrase boast of heraldry and pomp of power? The poet has used the phrases boast of heraldry and pomp of power because human beings take excessive pride in telling the stories of their forefathers and showing their power to other people. Okay, let's move on to the stanza number 10. Nor, a, nor you, ye proud, impute to these the fault. If memory o'er their tomb no trophies raise, where through the long-drawn aisle and fretted vault the pealing anthem swells the note of praise. Now look at this. Look at the meaning of the difficult words first. A is you in plural in archaic English. Impute is to attach or attribute. Aisle is passage between two rows of chairs in the church. Fretted water is carved arc -like, arch like roof of the church. Fretted actually means wood decorated with a particular pattern. Vault is arced structure. Peeling anthem is music heard in the church. Peeling is creating sound like a bell. Anthem is song. Note of praise is an expression of approval. Okay, let's try to understand 10th stanza. Nor you. Poet is addressing to those a proud. Who is he addressing to? Proud. Nor you a proud impute. Do not impute. Impute is attribute or attach. Do not attach the fault to these people. Nor you a proud impute to these. To these people. Do not attribute the fault. Do not say that these people are faulty. Because if memory over the tomb, no trophy is raised. If you, see, if you say that memory has not raised any trophy on their tomb, then tell me where through the long drawn aisle and fretted vault from the church, the pealing anthem swells the note of praise. How this sound uh, comes out from the church in praise of these people. That is what Poe trying to say. If you look carefully at the 10th ten, uh, ten stanza, in it, poet says, nor you, you proud, attribute to these the fault. It can be paraphrased as you proud, do not attribute fault to these poor people. Poet anticipates that proud people may think that these poor people are at fault because there are no trophies raised over their tongue. Therefore, he tells proud people that if there are no trophies raised over their tomb 
by the memory how through long passages between chairs in the church and through carved arch like arch like roof of church pealing anthem that is music heard in church becomes louder and cre- creates the praising sound poet constructs the idea that memory has raised the trophies over the tomb of the poor people too with the help of rhetorical question framed in the uh, framed in the 10th stanza the simple meaning of the last three lines of 10th stanza can be paraphrased as if memory has not raised the trophies over the tomb there would not have the praising note heard through the church song which becomes louder when it passes through long drawn aisle and fretted vault of church the music that comes from church sings praising note for the dead forefathers of the hamlet according to the poet through stanza 8 9 and 10 Poet tries to state that all human beings are equal and that one group of people should not consider the other group inferior or unimportant on the basis of wealth and power. Poet's philosophy of life and death is quite clear in these stanzas. I hope you have understood